A-R-E podcast episode number 44. Welcome to the Welcome to the A-R-E podcast. A-R-E podcast. Where it's all about encouraging and inspiring you today so you can fulfill your dream of becoming a licensed architect tomorrow. And now your host, David Doucet. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the ARE Podcast. In this episode, we are going to talk about our part two of Eric competing in the X Prize. Uh, so a very important component of this is Eric, and Eric, as always, is with us. Hello, Eric. Hey, everyone. And you are in Portland at the moment for a second? Today. Today I'm home in Portland. <laughs> uh, so last episode we talked all about the X Prize, how you uh, got selected for it, the process, the the funnel that they put you through, the training, the presentation, the skill work, and all of that good stuff. For really, what is this once in a lifetime opportunity? This episode we're going to talk all about your. Uh, what was it called again? Design, not competition, desi- competition design, your competition design, what you came up with, how you guys came up with that and, and how you present it and all that. So let's jump into that. So I guess right at the outset, let's talk about your competition design and what your proposal was, and then we can get into the, uh, behind the scenes of that. Okay. Uh, uh, the elevator pitch. That's what we need. The elevator. The elevator pitch is really quite simple. We were thinking very clearly about the other X prizes and how they worked, how they were a very clear finish line. So the example I gave in, in the other episode was the very very first X prize was launch three human beings a hundred kilometers into the air, have them return safely, and repeat it two weeks later. And um, it's a very clear finish line. Either you do that or you don't do that. And what's great about those those parameters is that they also kind of hint at other requirements. Sending three human beings hints at the size of the capsule, the requirements for, for life support, uh, the weight issues, right, with people. Having it go 100 kilometers shows a strength of the booster, how high it needs to go, the instrumentation it needs to do, but it's a bare minimum viable product of getting to space without having to go further. And then having it doing two weeks later is really an engine of of affordability, right? The, that you can reuse that same rocket two weeks later and do it in an affordable way. And so part of creating these prize requirements is designing it so the the rules seem simple, but behind them is a lot of thought. That's That's really where where I'm going. That's my preface. It's all this. And, okay? and as part of that is you already know, not that your back uh, is against the wall, but uh, you just using the building industry, which is where you're coming in at, you're competing against clean water, cancer. Uh, I think there was another ALS. ALS. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're competing, you're competing against some very hardcore, very relatable, very wide appealing subject matter and then you're coming in with some kind of um, construction or building um, design proposal so you already know you're you're up you're up against the wall in some respects in terms of appealing to everybody for the layman to understand it right you know and the the other prizes that we were competing against uh, like the desalinization team their prize proposal was very specific about the number of gallons per hour given a certain given you know and it, with a certain affordability to it and they they actually struggled a little to define those prize parameters in a clear way the cancer team ended up making their prize about cancer detection rather than cure which is also interesting the ALS team um, really created a, an armature almost like a robot Skeleton, like that Matt Damon movie where he where he <laughs> he goes to the to the um, planet colony with Jodie Foster. I forget the name of the movie. They kind of essentially designed an armature that would help people with ALS continue to be mobile and get out of the house. So they didn't cure ALS per se. That wasn't what they were going for. Uh, they were really going for extending the life of the people that are struggling with the disease. So. That was also interesting too. Is that I think everybody went in hoping that the can the cancer team would say, 
okay, here's the cure we're looking for, but they didn't. Or the ALS team would say, here's the cure we're looking for, and they didn't. I, on the other hand, really informed our team that we're trying to upend construction. We're trying to disrupt construction and rethink of it in a new way. And can you, before we get into the details of your and I design competition, is that the right term? Yeah. Okay. Before we get into the de- details of it, can you, can you tell me in, in like uh, two sentences or sort of, I don't know if you had a mission statement or exactly what it is and then we can dive into it? So uh, everything XPRIZE does, they ask you to create what they call an MTP, a Massive Transformational Purpose. And it's their, it's their vision statement. It sounds very and Burning Man, actually. It, yeah, it probably is. <laughs> and um, and so our massive transformational purpose, uh, and we we really went went back and forth on it and really polished the wording. It's like a mission statement for for a nonprofit or or an organization. And so our MTP for this was buildings that are alive, adapt, and evolve to make us well. The the key word that I heard there is the one that jumped out is alive. Would would that be correct? Yes. And uh, tell us why the word alive is part of that. First of all, say that again because I think I heard building and then I heard alive and then I heard other architecture talk. Uh, so say that again and then explain why alive is so important. Buildings that are alive, adapt, and evolve to make us well. You sound like such an architecture student. I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and obviously this was, uh, it took, I think, last time we were talking about a month of researching other options or just kind of throwing things against the wall and to see what was stick. So it took about a month to come up with essentially what was your final design competition, correct? No, it came. It was just a month just to go through all the market failures of construction, all the things wrong with construction, all the things where it's failing, and then um, and then creating the background research of here are all the innovations in the last two hundred years to that. So we started with, you know, a basic balloon framing in the eight in the uh, you know in the eighteen um, twenties. <laughs> and how it had certain failures. It it created these fire chases along the walls if you did a second floor. And, and so we took standard balloon framing and converted it to platform framing, if you remember your history. Right, right. And uh, But then the balloon framing and the platform framing had no shear, so we added shear panels. And then it really had no waterproofing, so we added a vapor barrier and waterproofing. And then it was ugly, so then we had to add some sort of siding. Um, and then on the inside, first we did, you know... Um, you know, daub plaster with, you know, chicken wire and plaster, but it cracked all the time. And, and if you wanted to hang something on the wall, you couldn't. So we had to have molding. It, it was a very additive process that we'd gotten to. And nobody had, because I think we talked about some of this subject matter last episode, but in terms of X prize, nobody, there wasn't or hasn't been a building kind of component before. Uh, so nobody X prize wise had really dove into the construction industry the last 100 years or 200 years. Uh, so you, your team is the first uh, to do that. You're the outlier, really. Yes. Uh, and, and so we had gone through this research and, um, you know, I even have a whole spiel of it in my talks that I, that I give now where I go through I mean, I can do it. I can do it for you here. <laughs> no, no, catch us, catch. I want to talk. I want to talk about specifically about your design competition. Okay. Uh, the, the so uh, how how did you get there, or or I guess maybe more interesting, what what is it? Like what are so, what was your proposal? Let me just unveil the proposal, and then we can work backwards. I think that's the that's what everybody's waiting for anyway. I've been trying to do that since we started the podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> And just and just for for the record, in my talks, that's what I do. I I just I list it right up front. It's you know it's right at the beginning, and then I then I go backwards because everybody's in suspense. So here it is. We call it the Prostruction X Prize because Prostruction is the opposite of construction. That was the name we came up with. Oh, nice. 
And that was after a hundred different names, <laughs> you know, that we were rattling around forever. Prostruction was the one that I think resonated with everybody, and it still does to this day. Um, but the Prostruction X Prize, simply put, is grow us an eight foot by eight foot wall. Have it match the typical properties of a of a regular wall in terms of strength. Uh, don't make it too heavy, right? In terms of shear, we had we had very specific descriptions of what that meant but match the typical properties of a a regular wall add in certain biological features maybe the wall absorbs co2 or maybe it absorbs vocs or or maybe it glows right we had a list of 12 different biological opportunities that you could do that you would get bonus credits for grow this eight foot by eight foot wall in six months from start to finish and then win 10 million dollars that and and that's why a little while ago I was talking about the alive. It, it, you are growing it. It's it's a living organism, and and there's so much to talk about here. But I just remember one of the conversations we had while you were doing this, as you were actually at MIT talking to the best of the best with these scientists, and and uh, if I remember correctly, them essentially saying, "Yeah, this is possible." And, and yes. what's cool about the X Prize is that opens a lot of doors for you and you really get access to the best of, uh, of the best. So maybe do you want to talk a little bit about the MIT experience? Um, or do you, how do you want to do it? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's amazing. (laughs) So in doing, in doing my research, um, we remember we didn't start out saying we're going to grow we're going to grow materials or we're going to grow a wall. We we started looking at it very objectively trying to eliminate our biases and you can, you can, you can. This is this is why we did that podcast on biases because I learned so much about cognitive biases that we all bring to problems. Um, so we 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 worked really hard to to map out all of our biases towards construction. I knew that being being a, a earthy crunchy hippie or green architect, having worked for students of Frank Lloyd Wright, that I you know I I was going to come with certain biases to the project and I was trying to eliminate them. Did you have any idea because your firm is called Organic Architecture and homage to Frank Lloyd Wright. Did, so did you have any idea when you started this process of this idea of growing a living building or or if not when at the point of this process did that pop up? So I had I had a sketch that one of my old mentors Malcolm Wells had had sketched. And if you don't know who Malcolm Wells is, Google him. He's the father of underground building. And he – not only was he the biggest uh, love sweetheart guy in the world, but incredibly talented. And, and he used to take a, a Pentel sign pen, those black Pentel sign pens that, that we all sketch with. He could, he could just create a symphony on paper with this Pentel sign pen. He, he was a great sketcher. And I had a sketch from him that he did as a joke. And it shows a bunch of houses like popping out of the ground like crops. Really? Yeah. And um, and 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 they each had little. Um, you know how normally if you're if you're growing a garden, you have a little sign that says carrots, another one that says lettuce. He he did it. He did the sketch with um, the crops, and one said 1989, 1992. Like it showed years of stages of growth. Wow. So I had that, and we had been we had been looking at it and using it as a. Um, as a joke, really, we'd kind of been putting it in as kind of a joke because, frankly, I didn't think it was possible to grow buildings. Right. So I, that's what I went in with, knowing that I, that I had this joke that Mac had sketched, and um, so that 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 sketch was in the back of your mind, kind of just going into this whole process. Oh my God, it's been in the back of my mind my whole life because okay. I had it. In my, I had it. In my he he's, he did it in the '80s, so I had it in my thesis. <laughs> at school, right? right? So that's that's how much this has been in my life. This sketch forever. Wow, so it, it's always there. It's always there. It wasn't one of those things that you just covered up and years ago and uncovered for this. It's just always been rattling in your brain somewhere. It's uh, yeah, it's, interesting. I, I, it's, I've been obsessed with it forever. I've had it in my talks over and over again, just because it's it's it it's because it's it's just a very simple but powerful idea. But I but I honestly went in there with the XPRIZE thinking, but this isn't possible. And so I really thought we would be, um, I think my first thought was, well, drywall and Portland cement are the two biggest embodied energy impacts in a building. I'd really like to find a way to eliminate them. 
that would that that was the only bias I went in, but I was very open about it with the team, saying, just so you know, this is kind of my hidden agenda of how do we not have drywall anymore and not need Portland cement anymore. Right. But that was it. Okay. What changed was in doing our background research, we had discovered people had invented um, they invented self healing concrete. Right where it cracks and kind of oozes and heart rehardens again, they had they had come up with um, transparent aluminum, which was something that I knew about from from Star Trek Four. <laughs> <laughs> but this there was an actual thing called transparent aluminum. There were all these kind of amazing innovations that we had seen, including um, nano robots that are self assembling that that work in a swarm hive capacity and could essentially build things. There are all these incredible sci-fi things, but they'd never taken off. So what I had was I had a list of market failures, ways that the 200-year-old construction process we use doesn't really work, but we still do it that way, and, a, and another list of incredible things that sounded like science fiction that were cool and viable, but never took off. Which, and which, I, which is interesting, and I think we've talked about this in other podcast episodes, is what technology has done in the last 20 years uh, has been incredible with computers and iPhones and all automation of every, it's affected every industry from airlines to whatever industry. However, building construction seems to want the one that hasn't caught up as much. Obviously there's been some breakthroughs and there's, there's, there's been some technological advancements in construction, but I think as a whole, like you've mentioned before, we're still building the same way we were building 100 or 200 years ago. Right. And in, in my talks, I, I'll even show I'll, – I'll show two houses being framed. One, the date will come up and it will say um, 1919 and the other one will say 2019. And they're basically the exact same. Right. Just one, one picture's in color. <laughs> right. And then you know what I remind people is that, listen, I, would sh I could show you one from 1819 – but cameras hadn't been invented yet. Right. Right. So I, I, so I can only describe it to you. And so that's the trouble. We, we literally have been building the same way for 200 years with just minor kind of polish improvements to it. The, the trouble is that I also had this list of innovations that weren't taking off. I had healthier alternatives to, to drywall. I had alternatives to concrete, but they were they were always relegated to seen as experimental. They weren't adopted by code. They weren't accepted by code. Uh, they the companies weren't able to scale. They didn't get enough funding. We had a whole list of reasons why these innovations never took off. Well, and we'll so we'll look at something as as simple as gray water and just recycling your uh, water, you know, uh, sink water to the toilet and all of that. Some municipalities finally allow that. Others still don't. Um, so just in terms of making things code compliant, uh, municipalities uh, in general or as a whole and states are very behind in adapting or adopting these new new technologies, which gray water is not a new technology, but that that shows the, the struggle that we face in the industry. Yeah, exactly. So but we also had a list of things that, that had taken off. So. Um, healthy materials, transparency labels, EPDs, LCAs, uh, declare labels and such, th those took off. Um, so when in this process did, did this idea of, okay, let's, let's talk about growing a wall? When, like, are we six weeks in? Are we two months in? Because I think you had about nine months to work on this? Yeah, we had nine months. Okay. So, th so the growing wall months, came when? It came four months in when... In doing my research, I discovered on the MIT Synthetic Biology website, they had a list of things synthetic biology could do, this field of synthetic biology. And one of them was uh, uh, we could grow organs that perfectly, you know, perfectly adapt to the host. Um, we could engineer foods that could feed the entire world so nobody would go hungry. And number three was we could grow a building. We could grow a house. It's it's on the, it's still on their website, actually. right? So so okay. So you you not stumbled upon, but you came across this on the the MIT website, which right. then um, then I guess talk about uh, or fast forward. When did you um, visit MIT? Were you now two, uh, five months in? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so how did that you know, go? Like five months? Would you just call him up and say, "Hey, this is Eric with X Prize, and I want to I want to meet with you." <laughs> yeah, that's all I did. So I I 
so I stumbled upon this field of synthetic biology. I started looking at different synthetic biology movements going on. And what synthetic biology really is, it's biologists taking DNA and manipulating DNA to do what you want it to do. Now, that's, is, the, is, this, what, is this like stem cell stuff? So I know that gets a little controversial or is it like completely different? It's a little different in that stem cells specifically are harvested from uh, aborted embryos. And so the okay. – the, the, the Christian right was ob objecting to stem cells initially because they thought it somehow – it led to more abortions, which right. it doesn't. Right, right, right. Okay. But it, it's it's in the same venue in that it's biologists manipulating DNA. And okay, that's, exactly. That's it's the same. So what I did – and this is typical fashion – I think any architect would do this. I said, okay, who are the top 20 synthetic biologists in the world? I'm going to contact all of them. Right. <laughs> and so I – you know, I I found that there were three in particular that were really keen on this idea of, of growing a building, growing a house. Um, uh, the guys at the guys at MIT. Uh, so I, I reached out to Professor Weiss, at, who runs the Synthetic Biology Lab at MIT. This sounds like right up your alley, by the way. I could just imagine you having like, well, I don't want to say it here, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I, I reached out to uh, Professor Endy at at Stanford. Uh, who, who, who? By the way, was an MIT disciple, and he was one of the radical ones. Twenty years ago, it was like, yeah, we should totally grow a house, and he, now he's at Stanford, and then, uh, and then the guy at um, Harvard, who I'm blanking on his name. Um, How old are these guys generally? They're my, they're forties. Oh, okay, all right. They're not like some sixty-five year old, seventy year old who's been you know, doing this stuff forever. They're they're fairly young. Ish. Yeah, they're they're really it's um it's really kind of cool. They're they're um it's a it's a relatively new field, so I think it attracts kind of more cutting edge biologists. Right. So I, I, I wrote to I wrote to those three in particular. Plus I remember I teach at BAC in Boston. So I knew I was going to Boston that August. Right. To teach again. So the MIT and Harvard guys, I was like, I'm I think I said um I think I name dropped a couple of things. I said I'm coming to teach at BAC, so teacher to teacher, right? Right. Um, uh, I'm with the X Prize. Name drop that a little bit, and um, and then I found people that we had in common. So I said, uh, you know, I'm also friends with uh, Dave Doucet or whoever I do. Whoever right. I said. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, and to my surprise, they they agreed to agreed to meet with me. So um, so I'm in Boston. It's a hot summer day. MIT is, if you've never been to Boston, it's across the river. Um, the Charles River, that would be. It's across the Charles River. And so it's already hot, and then the river is buggy and humid. And so I remember um, basically uh, I think I think I rode my bike from, from the back bay to MIT and, and then met with them. And it was cool because I walk in, and he, he looks like a just a typical biologist guy. He's got the lab coat on. Um, but I start talking to him about what are you working on? What are you struggling with? Um, did they have like sheep roaming around there? No, but I was afraid to touch ever, anything because I knew, that there was, <laughs> right. I knew that there was creepy bacteria all over the walls. <laughs> right. so I, didn't, I didn't even want to shake anybody's hand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, but I, you know, I, I wanted to know what's possible beyond just what the magazines say, because here's, I mean, really directly from the horse's mouth here, what's possible, right? And so I said, what if I wanted to, um, what, what if I wanted to have the wall change color? And um, like Professor Weiss said, oh, that's easy. And I said, okay, what if I wanted to um, absorb VOCs? Easy. What if I wanted to glow like a firefly? He's like, oh, that's easy. Uh, okay. So, um, so wait, let me just stop you for a second. So it's not even like this guy really had to calculate anything, think about anything. It's just yeah. like, oh yeah, we can do that. He didn't, he didn't flinch. He didn't hesitate. Crazy. He just kept saying, oh, the, oh that's easy. And I said, I said, no offense. <laughs> By the way, I recorded this whole thing too, because I knew that I'm so dumb that I wouldn't understand half of what he was talking about, but he was nice enough to dumb it down for me. Right. <laughs> right. But, uh, so I said, so you're telling me that if I if I wanted to grow a wall and remove a nail out of the wall, like I was hanging a picture and I remove it, I could have the wall heal itself. And he said, yeah, that's easy. 
and I said, "Okay, I'm getting I'm getting a little uneasy <laughs> right. with your use of the word easy." <laughs> And I think when I remember specifically, like we talked and just randomly I called you, whatever it was, but I think you had just left that meeting and we were talking about this and I'm like, holy cow. Uh, but keep keep going. Sorry. So I said, I, I said, why why do you say that's easy? Because easy is not a word that scientists use. Right. It's like it's like um, Matt Damon in The Martian where he goes, I don't know if you realize this, but physicists never use the word fast. <laughs> Right. It was like that. Right. And um, and so he said, the reason it's easy is because I've already identified all of the DNA markers that do all of those things. Wow. See, we already know what those are. All we would do is drag and drop them like software packages into whatever you're into, whatever matrix you're growing. Wow. Now, to prep, I should I should preface this by saying uh, to prep for this meeting, I, I read several books on synthetic biology. OK just so I would have at least a working understanding of what's possible. And that's a whole other mind blowing experience because apparently within every one of you in, in all of our bodies is the genes for if I, if, if you wanted to grow a hand out of your forehead, <laughs> like you could, you, you could essentially turn it on, on and off the right genes and suddenly a hand would grow out of your forehead if, if you needed to um, that for whatever reason. Right. Wow. So there's a bunch of weird, trippy stuff in in the blueprint of DNA anyway that we've since learned in the last five years. And so I'd, I'd read these books and prepared for it. So I had at least a working a working knowledge that I wouldn't offend him. That was really what I didn't want to do. But, but he was he but, kept going through and saying how easy all this stuff was. And was, was this synthetic biology, obviously with your organic architect background, was synthetic biology, was this still a pretty new world to you then? Like, was this something you were were learning? Oh, wow, I, I didn't really know too much about this i didn't i didn't really know anything about it beforehand um i had i'd read an article in national geographic um but that that had been recently and that's kind of what led me to to looking up okay who are the literally who are the top 20 synthetic biologists in the world uh but that was a dedicated search I did. So, and are you in the lab? Are you in his office? Where are you at this point? Oh, no, I'm in the lab. I'm literally at MIT on campus in his lab. There's wow. notes. There's whiteboards with weird uh, Martian writing everywhere. Wow. I took a picture. I even took a picture of his office <laughs> because it was so crazy. And I, sh- I showed him my talks of this is his whiteboard. Like, it, and there's no English on it. It's all like, right. <laughs> it's all chemistry and stuff. Was Matt Damon there or did they have like a statue of Matt Damon there? Yeah, he was the janitor. Exactly. <laughs> still, still the janitor 20 years later. So I said, okay, hotshot. And I'm joking with him at this point because he's teasing me. Okay. I said, I said, how, what do you mean by this? And he pulls out his phone and he flips through a couple pictures and he shows me on his phone. He's like, see this? He said, yesterday we grew a liver. Oh my and I God. said, I said, what? He's like, yeah, it was pretty cool. I, I took um, skin cells from the back of my hand. I programmed those to be stem cells, which is easy, by the way. That's what he said. <laughs> and then I commanded those stem cells to become a liver. Because apparently within all of our cells is the potential to differentiate into any other type of cell. Right. Which I, which I knew from the book. Right, right. Book side so... He's showing me this, and I said, "Are you telling me you cloned your friggin' liver yesterday?" And and he's like, "Oh no, this isn't a clone. This is actually a better liver. We improved on this liver." Wow. I said, what do you mean? And he said, "Well, this liver can do things my liver can't do." <laughs> and I I was like, "What? Like juggle? I don't understand." <laughs> right. And he's like, "No, this liver can alert us if it encounters signs of disease, like cirrhosis." And wow. I said, "What is?" It? send you a, a snapchat like what, what do you mean does it have bluetooth <laughs> yeah and he says it releases a chemical that changes color in the if it encounters certain diseases and i'm like okay that's amazing right, right? you're basically going to save millions of lives i i'm an, i'm just an architect Right. I'm just schmucky the architect trying to grow a wall, selfishly trying to grow a wall here right. and just seeing just seeing if it's even viable. Because remember, we hadn't put forth this as a proposal yet. I was just I was just doing due diligence. I was just trying to figure out if this is even a field worth exploring. And um, and so that's where we had this. The two of us had this big breakthrough. He said, 
he said, absolutely, with no hesitation, he said, absolutely. And I said, why do you say that? You didn't, you didn't hesitate. And he said, the liver I'm showing you is the size of a quarter. He said, I need to grow a liver that's liver sized, the right. size of you know, basically, what's a, you know, what's a liver, 18 inches across or whatever. Livers are big. It's a big organ. He said, this one's the size of a quarter. I, I, we have trouble growing things to a certain shape and size, especially large. Okay. And so that's when our conversation led into, well, how are you doing it? And so the way they're doing it is they're using what biologists call a scaffold. And uh, when I think of scaffold, like you, I think of a scaffold on a a building, right? Little metal pipes that kind of create a structure and you hang things on it. Um, That's basically what nature does too. It creates a scaffold. You and I are walking scaffolds. We have a skeleton core that is a scaffold that grew with us as we grew. That's one type of scaffold. Uh, An apple is another type of scaffold. It's basically uh, uh, cellulose and fiber arranged in a very boring way with apple DNA woven through it. That's another type of scaffold. But it's basically how nature creates a, a, a structural system that grows with the entity. In, in in that respect, is the scaffold different from the structure or sometimes they're one and the same? Sometimes they're one and the same. Like in the case of a coconut husk, right? The coconut is the scaffold. We don't eat coconut husk, but we eat the milk inside. Right. In the case of a human being, it's the skeleton, which is a structural system that grows within us, but it's not exposed in any way. Um, but if that structural system, if one of your beams and your arms breaks – your 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 scaffold can heal itself, right? Um, and and your your scaffold also achieves a, a point of homeostasis. It stops growing because I, for me, I stopped growing at twenty five, and I wish I kept going, but I didn't. So I stopped at you know five nine and a half or whatever I am. So it's so nature also has mechanisms in the DNA to control when to turn on and off the growth. Because it's not like the older you get, you just keep getting taller and taller. That would be insane. Right. <laughs> Imagine any of the old guys 10 feet tall. That'd be cool, but it would create a lot of problems. So um, so we already I already knew about these mechanisms for turning things on and off at different points. DNA even has a built-in, um, built-in clock to it, which I won't get into. But DNA uh, – it, it basically built within your DNA are, are signals of when to turn on certain things and when not to, which is why you get – uh, you know, we all get, let's say, um, uh, hormones are released at, you know, when you're about age 13 and you go through puberty. That's basically your DNA has has that kind of built in and tells it when to turn it on and when to turn it off. Is that why I have gray hair? That's why you have gray hair. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, you have it too. So. Well, I have a lot of it. But <laughs> but it's it's also why some people go bald early, prematurely, because their DNA is telling them, oh, yeah, you can let go of that hair now uh, er, too early. Right. So just within what I just said, you could see that there's lots of potential cures for lots of potential things. That's what synthetic biology is aiming to do, um, and they're just scratching the surface. Uh, and so when I once I realized that he was having trouble growing things big, and the scaffolds that he's using are all small and and um, artificial. He's not he's not growing scaffolds yet. He's using essentially man-made scaffolds and laying laying DNA on top of it. That's why his liver was only the size of a quarter because the scaffold he used was the size of a quarter. Right. And I said, well, can't you use a bigger scaffold? And he said, the trouble is um, we need to grow the scaffold and we're not doing that yet. Ah. That's our, that's our big obstacle right, you know, right now. And, it's, and all the other stuff they have in place. But how do we grow the scaffold so I can grow a liver? I'm not growing liver. I'm, you know, I could – imagine like you took a piece of styrofoam. You – You've kind of sanded it to look like a liver, and then you smeared <laughs> DNA on top of it. That's kind of what that's kind of what they're doing now. But it, that's not that's a it, that they can't keep continuing doing that. They need to find a way to grow the scaffold at the same time. Right, and we're not we're not talking about when you plant tomato plants uh, in in your wood scaffold. We're not talking about a structure. Uh, we're talking about something that is grown as well, not something that's man made that we just plop in there. 
Right. Tomato stakes are a good example of a man-made scaffold. We're, we're encouraging the plant to grow in a certain direction. We're, we're trying to accelerate the growth. So we, we put a simple, dumb wooden stake in the ground and kind of just tie string to the plant so it, it, it can hold itself up fast enough to grow the tomatoes a little faster. That's an artificial scaffold. Um, it doesn't work. It's, it's, not, it's certainly not sustainable, but it also doesn't get them to where they need to go, um, which is they want to grow full-on organs and cure diseases. And remember, this would if you, God forbid, ever needed a liver, they would essentially clone your skin cell. They, you know, they would take undifferentiated cells from your body, command those to become a liver, and grow not only a liver, it's not a transplant, but a perfectly matched liver. And you, they could and they and it would fit it, it would be accepted by your body a hundred percent because it's your body anyway. Well and 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 that is that's uh an, an issue with any kind of organ transplant is is the body that it goes into, is it going to accept it, is it going to reject it? I mean that's a whole nother thing. But did you guys talk about um if once they figure this scaffolding out, for them to grow a full size liver, did you talk about how long that might take? Yeah, so right now that's the other problem because they're using artificial scaffolds it takes a long time. Okay. So their current scaffolds they they need to be able to grow a natural scaffold of a sufficient scale affordably and quickly. Those were his words. They need to be able to manipulate the DNA to elicit the exact size and shape desired which they're not totally able to do. Okay. They they need to uncover the inputs needed for growth so they can use whatever affordable resources are available. Because they don't – if it takes 20 years to grow a liver, that's useless. You might as well clone a human. By the way, this right. is one of the things they're talking about. If you need a liver, they could just clone you and then grow another liver and kill the clone. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> would be, which I think, by the way, was a premise of, of um, a movie with Scarlett Johansson which I'm blanking on the name of. But in the future, they basically grow cl- accelerated clones of you and harvest your organs. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they need to be able to grow this in quote normal conditions, meaning um, you know uh, in a hospital is what his requirements were. Right. I need I needed to be able to grow it in even worse conditions. I needed to be able to grow it outside, like a building. Right. So then, then the you were talking about the the light bulb went off for both of you. What what exactly was it? Was it about the scaffolding, or was it how do you make the scaffolding bigger? What exactly was it? My fear was that I that if that that I would be a distraction to his important work. That was my concern. I said, aren't I a huge distraction? He said, no. And we realized what this X prize really is. It's not a growing the wall X prize. It's not a glow in the dark wall X prize. It's not a self healing wall X prize because he already knows the DNA that does those things. Right. It's really a scaffolding X prize. Ah, okay. And so by launching this prize, not only would it, would it have, would it launch a global competition that would invite ideas from all over the world, of how do you cheaply, easily, and quickly grow a scaffold? Um, but by using it as a, for a wall, as as opposed to an organ, um, it's okay. You know, for instance, with a wall, I don't need to be sterile. Nobody's going to eat the wall. It, I'm not going to stick the wall in anybody's body and worry about it being rejected by by your by your white cells. Um, I can be off by whole inches. And, 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 it's, and it's okay because it's just a wall. And so the joke that I made was, we're off by inches all the time in construction anyway. We just shim it, right? We just, exactly. we just deal with it. So had, had, had it even crossed his mind, this idea of, of essentially growing something that, like we were just talking about a wall, that doesn't need to be essentially sterile, for lack of a better term? Had that even crossed his mind before? No, I, I don't. I don't think so, but he's yeah. a super smart guy and he probably everything has crossed his mind. Yeah, but, that's true. <laughs> but... Uh, um, but I knew – and plus, remember, the reason I was there is because growing a wall or growing a building was already on the MIT website. So they had been talking about this for a while. I don't know – what I don't know is if he had dismissed it as an opportunity. But once we realized, well, if you get people to start to grow a wall that's eight feet by eight feet, you know, plus or minus a couple inches, that would go a huge way to solving my scaffolding problem. Right, exactly. And so suddenly I realized that I was helping him achieve his goal, not working against him. So the issue then is right now is it's all there to be able to do it. We just don't know how to do it on a bigger scale yet. Um, and and I would imagine in a few years, obviously, we'll have that, that figured out. It's, it's like electricity. Somebody's going to discover it eventually. Yeah, which, by the way, is one of the things the X Prize folks talk about, which is what are the what are the discoveries that 
that um, are standing in the way of progress? What are the discoveries that are, that are going to happen anyway? You know, we talk about how if Isaac Newton hadn't discovered gravity, somebody would have eventually. But what are those discoveries that we could maybe accelerate and discover sooner that would help other people? Right. Okay. So, and how long was this meeting at MIT with this guy? Um, about two hours. Oh, okay. All right. So, so you do that. Um, you come away from MIT. Uh, you're getting. Uh, you bring the results back to the team. Uh, can, can, speed me up a little bit. Where are we in, say, <laughs> month seven? Well, I didn't even bring it back to the team. I'm standing outside his building, calling them. <laughs> fr- <Right. laughs> frantic and I recorded and I recorded the meeting so they could hear it too because I because I, I didn't want to bring a whole entourage with me I, I I I knew that if I could get him to talk more it was just one-on-one right of course but and then I, and then I still had remember I still also then had the meetings with um, uh, Harvard and Stanford too and they they chimed in on this as well um, and well this is now what we're thinking it's a scaffolding oh yeah brilliant so it's, but it started with the Professor Weiss one and then expanded even further. And what I was trying to get at is, okay, what's now possible? Could I, could I say that the wall has an R value of 13 and, S, and an STC rating of 30? Could I say that the wall can't weigh more than 50 pounds per square foot because then I couldn't use it in existing buildings if it was too heavy? Right. Could I, could I, more importantly, could I, sit, could I give the wall a one-hour fire rating? Right. So these these were the requirements that we started to say. If, if you're going to grow a wall, I knew that codes were always an obstacle to acceptance of new technologies because we had done this research. But if I can make a wall that has a one-hour fire rating, that has a 15-minute 15, 15 flame spread rating, that has an R value of 13, an STC of 30, and doesn't – you know, and, and, and it can support 300 pounds per linear foot like a normal balloon framing or platform framing wall, we'd really be on to something. Right. So that was that was the aha moment was after the synthetic biology meetings, then figuring out, okay, I can grow a wall that does these things now. And this has been confirmed by, uh, by biologists, and we could bake those into the requirements. And as we talked about in the last episode, you're not here to – the purpose of this particular XPRIZE is not to – come up with a solution or solve the problem you're more presenting the problem giving the criteria and then that goes out if you win the x prize that goes out and then teams will compete to do what essentially the the problem is yeah once once my x prize gets a, uh, selected to launch those are the nerdy words they use at x prize once it gets selected to launch it then goes out as a global competition with the whole billion dollar pr campaign uh and motor behind it and to solicit ideas from everybody, I had already I, – by talking to all these biologists and lots of other people, mind you, I, we talked to hundreds of different people working in these fields. I had already identified several teams that would that were going to do it anyway. So once this prize launched, I had already found uh, – five. there were five teams in particular that they had said to me, as soon as this launches, we're going for it. And um, And I knew who they – I know who they are. And and that was also part of it too, is because I wanted to launch the prize with a little bit of their input, um, but also it, remember by putting out a ten million dollar prize, it gets them to get their schools on board, their universities on board to go after it. It get it lets them attract grant funding to spend the money to pursue the prize. All that had to happen later, but I, I had already identified. Right. Potential, okay. Potential teams that could do that. All right. So let's let's you have the you want to essentially grow a building is what you're trying to do here. Well, uh, I'm trying to grow a wall. Grow a wall is what your uh, what your uh, proposal is. Right. Catch, catch us up. We're 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 month nine because we're forty five minutes in. We're we're <laughs> month nine. Uh, the teams are presenting. Is it nine teams total? There are nine nine teams total. We're okay, so this, what's what's happening? Yeah, we're all at this summit. Okay, you guys are presenting. And, tell tell me right. what's happening. We're we're all presenting, and we're not presenting just one thing. We're presenting over multiple days. So what they had us do was they gave us each our own room, like a ballroom. What city are you in? We're in. We're at the Terranea Resort in in L.A. Right along the coastline, right on the beach there. It's where gorgeous. you where you started the competition? Did you start there before? Well, we started at the X Prize offices in Culver City. Okay, theoretically, but we're in LA. Yeah, um, so it's all—it's a very LA-based crew that works there, right? Uh, but they do it at this Terranea Resort, which is gorgeous, and they gave us a ballroom, 
And then they gave us a budget to decorate that ballroom. So each team had kind of done different things. Our ballroom was uh, – that was a whole exercise in and of itself because I had to essentially – my team and I had to des- design what the room is. Uh, we had we had information graphics along the walls. We had um, weird trippy animations projecting everywhere. We had um, – um, <laughs> we had a, uh, examples of, of green materials that we had found along our research, including um, um, the, the stuff from Ecovative, which is the mushroom-based bricks. They had donated they had donated some mushroom bricks for us, and so my podium was surrounded by mushroom bricks. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bunch of weird, trippy stuff. And then we had the lights really dim, and so it was like a it was really um, trippy in there. And then uh, and th- but then we also had our essentially our findings designed into infographics that that we had put along the walls too we'd spent a lot of time just designing the room and they, luckily they gave us a, a budget to do all this anyway and by the way uh when you're doing it well going through this entire nine month process you're you can't talk about or reveal or post pictures or any of that stuff right no yeah i can't i can't really tell anybody but anything except in pursuit of the of the coming up with the you know competition design right. so yeah, it was a little. It was weird, and then, um, uh, and what's cool about it is, uh, they then had us present the first day. They had us present a, a ninety minute, ninety minute session, but I had to repeat it ten times that day. Did you have your own room, or were all you guys presenting in one room, or you each had your own ballroom and you themed it out? No, we each had our own ballroom. Okay, so like the the. Um, yeah, the water the water folks had their own room that was all designed. The ALS folks, the cancer, we each had our own ballroom. It's a big yeah. it's a big resort. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and but it's real, you know, a lot of fun. But I'm stuck in my own ballroom. I don't even get to hang out with my my friends from the other teams and see what they're doing. I don't get to see their presentations because all day long, I'm giving the same presentation ten times that day in a row. And I've I'd never even as a professional speaker, I can tell you, I'd never. I'd never had to give the same presentation 10 times in a row in a single day. It's like um, it's like you're essentially a celebrity doing a press tour because that's what they do. They'll go to a, a hotel room and they're just in there all day essentially answering the same questions uh, yes. from as the reporters keep cycling through, which is kind of exactly what you were doing. Right. But they and they and they did it by design. So they'd bring in 25 they had 250 advisors. They told okay. us. Okay. So they brought them in 25 at a time. Right. So you're not, this is not for the general public. This is not, you yeah. just walk on the street and go, this is all X prize people. This is all part of the selection process because you guys are presenting. This is where they are going to come away and decide who wins the X prize. That's what this is, right? No. Well, oh. uh, they're, they're coming away, not who wins the X prize, whose who's prize design is going to be launched. So well, that, okay, that's yeah, yeah, going to yeah. be picked to launch, right? Right, because only one team will go out to the public to solicit to hey solve this problem. So yes, that's right. yes, okay. And they had a very specific scoring criteria, and everybody had their own iPad of of how to input the scoring, and it was very complicated, a little too complicated. Uh, but uh, and I had to address certain. There were certain things I had I had to address at each. Um, at each presentation that they had specifically said, okay, now you need to address points 5, 14, 21, and 82. Right. So it was very specific. Um, and and the beauty of bringing in 25 at a time is 25 is a nice small group. It's a classroom, right? So, so there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of questions, a lot of engagement. I'm presenting slides. Do you but get? Also- do you get? I know you do this like professionally, but do you get nervous uh, at all, or were you nervous at all on this day? No, not at all, huh? Not. No, I was. I was too tired to be nervous. Okay. <laughs> Remember, we'd been up all night finishing the friggin' room, right? So that was the other part of it. Is like this room was like this annoying thing that it, all the teams had to finish, and we were all stressed about it. It was like being back in architecture school, I imagine, with pulling all nighters for the yes. final review. Yeah, that's exactly what it felt like. Wow. And, and my team, you know, I had, I had, a, I had an architect from USC and an architect from from Harvard. And so the three of us were used to staying up all night finishing stuff. Everybody else was complaining. I can't believe I have to stay up all night. I've right. never had to do this. <laughs> but right. I was, you know, I was like, oh, it's just studio time. Let's put on some Pink Floyd and let's just rock out. Right. <laughs> uh, 
so I was exhausted. And then having to do the same presentation 10 times in a row was – it's it's it mind-numbing. And then uh, – by the way, there, there are 250 advisors and you're getting 25 at a time. You never know who's in what group, but there are celebrities as their advisors. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I, and how long was each presentation? Celebrities in the in the room. So you're just sitting there and twenty the next 25 come in and you're like, oh, there's uh, Pharrell. Right. Okay, that's normal. That's totally normal. Why would I even panic that Pharrell's right. looking at me right now? <laughs> so yeah, that's going on. And how long was each uh, presentation? I re- I think they gave us a ninety minute slot, and then the remember, and the the poor twenty group of twenty five, they then would immediately move to another room, so because they had to sit through all. So you all had to do n- you had to do ninety minutes ten times essentially, or a ninety minute slot ten times. Yeah. Holy cow. In the same room. Yeah. They gave us a lunch break, but that was that was basically it. So you're not kidding. You you didn't really get to go explore the other rooms and see the other presentations. No, we had no. I never I never got to see any of the other main presentation, and none of us did. And um, but then that evening, we all had to present um, the the bold visioneer from each team, which was in my case was me. We all then had to present on the main stage in the main ballroom which held a thousand people. And so it was the 250 advisors, their dates, so that's 500, and then a bunch of other friends of XPRIZE, which are even more celebrities and famous people. Wait, is this, this is the same day, this is later in the evening after you were just in yeah. that one room presenting 10 times? Oh my God. Yeah, it That's was insane. So I, I'm, I'm, my brain is mush at this point. I've given the same presentation 10 times, to two, 25 people at a time to in- pretty intimidating people. Oh, hi, Elon Musk. Nice to meet you. Right. Okay. <laughs> hi, um, Sarah, Duchess of York. What the hell are you doing here? Nice to meet you. <laughs> Big fan. Okay. You know uh, what I mean? Oh, my God. Oh, here's Ariana Huffington. Not great. That's, that's what's happening. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then huge, huge leaders in the tech industry right. there right. who you don't recognize – because why would you? But you're like, who are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm the founder of Airbnb. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, and man. Then, and then that night, we then had to present on stage in the ballroom with a thousand people. It's all the, all the advisors, their dates, all the sponsors, all the other friends. It's over a thousand. And the ballroom it was pa- packed to the gills. Now, I've spoken to a, th- a thousand people and more before. That wasn't the intimidating part. The intimidating part was now all these people not only had seen my presentation, but seen all the other presentations. And I knew that they were in the cancer presentation and the ALS presentation. So I thought it best to go up there and go, friggin' cancer. You know, like that. <laughs> Did you go last? No. Okay. Uh, I don't remember what order I went in. Okay. I think they had me go first because they wanted to set the tone. Okay. I remember, yeah, for the for that first Friday night, they wanted me to speak first because they said, Eric's the funniest. Let him go first. Right. And I just did jokes at that point. Right. Because I'm like, listen, you know, uh, so, but it was really funny. That that part was filmed. There's pictures of it, um, which we'll put on the podcast so you can see it. And then, and then at the same time, um, I'm worried if my slides are going to work. I'm, I want to make sure the fonts are correct because they they were they didn't run it off of my computer. They ran it off their computer, which I always hate. Oh so yeah, that's, that's that worst. weren't working. The mic was the batteries in the mic were dying, so I insisted like, no, you got to replace these batteries right now. So in the dress rehearsal, the remote wasn't working, the mic wasn't working, and my slides had the wrong font. Uh, and so I was I was that's what I that's what makes me nervous is those things. By the way, just as a as a pro tip, if if you're ever presenting maybe at your local AIA chapter, wherever it is, make sure you get there early and you test out your slides because it's it's a common problem where they don't have the font that you created your keynote presentation or PowerPoint presentation on and it just messes everything up. So pro tip yeah exactly um and then again there were specific points they wanted us to hit that night because although the 250 advisors had seen the full 90 minute pitch and had a lot of detail at this point at the evening the other 750 people in the room hadn't seen anything were they was was this one big thousand people in a room were they all judging as well or that was just for show and the judging was from the presentations you were doing earlier the judging was only the 250 advisors that had the ipads yeah exactly okay so this is the this is the big show 
Yeah. So, yeah. and then we had two of these because the no- next night we had the closing thing. So it, it was it was pretty it was it was a lot of fun. It was chaotic. The people you met were exhilarating. You didn't know who to go to first. At one point, this is kind of a funny story. Um, at one point, Dean Kamen, the the brilliant engineer inventor guy who invented the Segway. Dean Kamen is he's first of all he's he's touring through the entire resort on this wheelchair that goes up and down that cl- can climb steps and stuff that he invented. And so he rides around on this thing that he invented. And at one point, Dean came and says, Eric. And I'm like, oh, my God, Dean came and knows my name. Holy crap. That's amazing. And you knew yes. who he was, obviously. Oh, yeah. I was yeah. a big fan. I've been a big fan of his forever. Okay. And I'm like, yes, Dean. Yes. Did you want to hug me or, <laughs> or uh, adopt me? <laughs> and he's like, uh, get a picture with me and Elon. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Did you say, uh, hold on a minute. I'm, I'm in the middle of something. <laughs> I was gonna do I was gonna do the old Don Rickles Frank Sinatra thing and go do excuse me I'm busy like the yeah, but I didn't <laughs> I real I realized oh yeah I'm still the help here which is <laughs> right. which is what an architect always is like even when you design the mansion for the rich person at the end of the day you're still the help right but but so there was a lot of stuff like that that was fun I was having a great time when I get tired I get even weirder and funnier than I normally am so uh, you know I was just delirious. Um, and then that night on the stage, it was basically I just did. I think they gave us 15 minutes, and I so I did 15 minutes of stand up about my project, and everybody was laughing. And um, uh, Sarah, Duchess of York, gave me a big hug, which was fun. And then you know, there's just a lot of fun stuff like that happening. But that's the that's the setting for pitching this. At the same time, I desperately want my prize to be chosen. Remember, of so course. there's there's also the competitive part too. Do do you think at this point? Uh, do you think that there is a, a, a good chance your project will be chosen or do you think, well, I mean, cancer and ALS and clean water, desalinization, those are all, did, did you know you were the underdog still at this point? Well, I think the other, you know, there were nine teams total. Um, I think, I think the other six, you know, the, me and the other five teams, the six of us, we all knew we were the underdogs by nature because who's going to want to Who's going to want to say to cancer or ALS, no, you can't go ahead. Right. But there were a couple things in our favor. One is because I knew they were going to go ahead, I also knew that they had already been – their sponsors had already agreed to fund the prize already. Mm-hmm. That, okay, well, I don't need to get first or second place. I need to just get – I just need to show. Right, I need to exactly. Get third place. And so, um, so this entire thing, my entire X Prize was sponsored by Lowe's. The hardware store people, right? Um, they had funded the prize up to now. They funded our team. They had funded uh, every, even the budget for the room. All came from Lowe's. They had funded this whole thing. They were really great uh, people. Very innovative. Very forward thinking. They know that the future is not a a, a bricks and mortar retail store, but something else. They were the they're, hi, were they were the higher ups there at the, this presentation. I'm sure. Yeah. So I was working with the head of their innovation lab, um, Kyle and Amanda. Uh, um, and who were awesome, but for the for the big night with the thousand people, of course, there's like the big the big folks from Lowe's came in, and I had to kiss their ring and shake their hand and stuff, and they they were all very nice and very supportive. But I had to ask them for ten million dollars. <laughs> right. I had to I had to say, listen, you know, before all this went down, a week before, I had to like present this to them and say, this is what we're going to show at at the summit at the resort. Uh, would you like to? Would you personally? No. Would Lowe's like to sponsor the ten million dollar prize? So the 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 team. So each team had their own corporate sponsor. Yes. And, and then it came down to the corporate sponsor could decide to essentially put up the ten million dollars to uh, fund the the prize or 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 yeah fund the prize. For the proposal to go out to the public, essentially. Yes, and and the X Prize Foundation is so good at set. They they had set up these sponsors ahead of time. They you know they have long relationships with them. Um, they're everything is handled beautifully. Everything at the resort is so well done. The X Prize team is our masters at coordinating all this stuff. I mean, it's all just the imagine just the best wedding you've ever been, and then multiply that by ten. That's kind of what right. that's kind of what this whole thing was, and just super impressive everything. And so, uh, but here I still had to ask the sponsors, listen, you sponsored us this far 
to develop this prize, here's what we've come up with after nine months. Would you sponsor the 10 million? And and when I had it on my calendar, I had it listed as um, money call. This is what I added on my calendar. Right. Because I knew I, I knew I had to do it. And that was, you know, it's kind of, a, I'd never asked for $10 million before. <laughs> no, I can't say as I, I have either. And no. did, did this call, this happen before the big presentation night? It happened. So I had the call a week before the big presentation. Okay. And, um, and it was with the innovation lab folks. And so I said, you know, okay, well, what do you think? And, it, and, and he was like, yeah, we're in. Really? And I, and I was like, oh, so for like a million or two million? He's like, no, for the whole thing. Seriously? I said, I said no, I don't know if you heard me. It's 10 million, not 10,000, 10 million dollars. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And I said, and then I stupidly said, um, hey, hey, man, um, can you guys afford that? <laughs> and he's like, we're an $80 billion a year company. We make that in like 20 minutes. Yeah, we can afford it. Wow. I was like, oh, yes, you're good. You're good then. Okay. Wow. So I, I didn't know that. You never told me that part. We never talked about that. That's interesting. So obviously they believed in, in what you guys were doing, of course. They were very, they were incredible. They were very cool. Every, it was just such a positive experience, the whole thing, everything. I mean, I, but what I didn't know was, and this was the last question I had for them. And I don't think I've ever said this to anybody. What I asked the Lowe's people for was, can I announce this at the summit? Oh, uh, okay. And, and he's like, I do not know if I can do that yet. Okay. Uh, let me let me get back to you. So meanwhile, a week passes. I'm busy getting the room together, getting my final slides together. Right, the team's working feverishly, um, and so that night on the stage, I'm about to go up and present to a thousand people, and I lean over and go, "Okay, <laughs> this is it. Can I tell them or not?" Right. Because I had a slide. I had a slide with the Lowe's Innovation Lab logo at the end. Okay. Knowing that if I'm not allowed to say it, I can just thank them. And if I can say it, I can announce it. Right. But either way, I, I, you know, I'm like, it's my last slide. So I do my presentation. Everybody laughs. It's like I just I do it as an hour of stand up because remember, uh, three quarters of the people in the room didn't see the full detailed presentation. So I just kind of laid out the vision for ProStruction and what we were thinking, but did it in a funny way. And then the very last slide comes up. By the way, I'm also making fun of like uh, the, the celebrities in the room because I put up a big, big picture of Pharrell, <laughs> <laughs> and then I and then I said I said I said Pharrell's here and everybody cheers and I said I asked Pharrell if I can tell everybody that this is his favorite prize that he liked our prize more than anybody else and he said no <laughs> and then everybody everybody laughs and I'm like Pharrell can I tell them that we're in your top your top three. <laughs> And he's like, fine. And he just wanted to get it. It was obvious he just wanted to get away from me. Right. And uh, and so I'm on stage with big picture of Pharrell behind me. And I said, so everybody says, hey, everybody, Pharrell says we're in his top three, so you can all suck it. And everybody <laughs> everybody laughed. <laughs> so so that's what was that's what I was doing. That was the shtick I was doing on stage, essentially. And then I get to the very end, and I show the Lowe's Innovation Lab logo. I'm the only one in the room other than the Lowe's people that know that they agreed to the 10 million. Right. And so my final thing is, is saying, and by the way, I'm thrilled to announce that not only has Lowe's sponsored our whole adventure here, but they've already agreed to do the 10 million. And the room erupted. Really? And um, Marcus, who's the CEO of XPRIZE, jumps on the stage and runs up and, ta and like hugs me, tackles me. No way. And I was like, Marcus, calm down. It's not it's not my bar mitzvah. Just relax. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> so that so that was the beauty of going first. Wow. So not only did I set the expectation that you had to be innovative or you had to be uh, entertaining for those fifteen minutes, but you had to you had to announce you've been funded. Oh, you did I, so that was part of it because because they wanted to know that oh you they it's funded, right? The ten the, the ten million is there. I knew I wasn't going to beat cancer or ALS, right. <laughs> nor, nor did I want to. I want them to the prizes to go ahead. And by the way, after nine months, I'm we're we're all like a family. Like I'm friends with the people on the team, and I want them to succeed. So it wasn't a competition anymore. It was right. more about okay, assuming ALS and ca cancer are going to go ahead, I I want to also show that I'm ready to launch. Exactly. That was my goal. Was let's just show them that we're ready, and I've done my work to get. Look, I've secured funding for the for the competition itself. And um, we've got all this and we're ready to launch. And so that's 
that's what I did. And the other teams did very similar things because we had talked about it openly. It wasn't a secret. Okay. Um, so uh, the desalinization team, for example, their sponsor, I forget who their sponsor was, they agreed to commit to their prize. And, you know, there were lots of other teams. The trouble was, and this continues to be the trouble, is suddenly X Prize thought they would go through this and out of nine teams, they'd get maybe one ready to launch. Right. Instead, what they had out of nine teams, they had like seven that are ready to launch. Was this a new, this, so this was a new quote unquote problem for them? They had never faced this before where we can't launch seven prizes at once. That's insane. They never, a, so they never even had that opportunity to cross paths that they would have seven ready to you launch. You got to remember, these are geniuses. They are very deliberate and smart about everything they do. Uh, and they, they, um, I don't want to say pessimistically, but they but they cautiously thought if we're if we get one ready to launch prize out of this process that we've never done before, we'll be happy. Ex- that, yeah, that's exactly. It's a numbers game to them, and they're thinking, okay, we got nine. Let's hopefully we can get one ready to launch. To their surprise, it sounds like they had seven ready to launch. Right. So, so that was good news and bad news. It was good news that they saw that my prize was ready to launch. But they saw all the other all these other prizes ready to launch too, and then it just became a matter of well, who do we launch first? And so um, that's been the argument in the in the three years since. And when um, when did they formally announce the the one that they're going to launch that they're going to move forward with? When how long after this did it happen? So that. So then the next night we had another 15 minute presentation from each team member and then they did they they did a whole thing where they had us all on stage they gave us these weird awards that that I'm I'm staring at it right now it's it's like made of titanium <laughs> it's this giant heavy thing that is engraved with my name um which is fun but uh can you take a picture and, and send that to me I'll put it on the link to the sure. podcast page But uh but then that night they announced they announced uh, which prize was ready was ready to launch, and uh, they they picked three: cancer, ALS, and then um, and then the the uh, we we all called it the teleportation group, be, <laughs> but it was the um, avatar group. Yeah, okay. Which which by the way was you know a bit of a ringer, but but I get it. But then we had all these other teams that were like, well, we're all ready to launch too. But because they had already set this up, we had we we only had a first, second, and third place. What do we do? And so there was a bit of a scramble at the last minute to figure out how to handle it on stage in front of everybody. Right. Um, so, uh, but in the three years since, we w- with X Prize, we've now worked out that okay, constru- the construction industry is very uh, ripe for disruption. It needs to be disrupted, and we've since then gone through a series of um, of. Uh, uh, workshops in cities all over the country with experts that I've helped pull in. And now we've mapped out 18 possible construction X prizes that, that might be needed. Prostruction is one of the 18. It's also the top of the list in terms of ready to launch because it's got the most work done, but there's a whole bunch of other potential X prizes that have been identified and, and you can download all of these in the, um, from the X prize website and we'll provide a link in the, in the podcast notes to it. So you're still talking to the X X Prize people a couple of years later. Yeah, it's slow. Like months will go by and I won't hear anything, and then suddenly it's like, oh hey, do you know um, we're doing a workshop? Do you want to come? And then do you have fifty experts you you want to invite? Right. <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be like that. It sounds like you're now the the kind of building expert guy. Oh no, I'm I'm one of them. They have yeah. they have they have lots of experts. Um, okay. Um, and and by the way, since in that time since, um, our mutual friend David Hertz, who's a great architect in Santa Monica or Venice, I should say, um, who's got a you know great body of work as a green architect, um, he also has this side project where he's interested in in water. So he just his team just competed for and won the Water Abundance X Prize. So yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. So they, were they on the end? Were they on the same creating the problem that you were, or were they on no. the end of uh, finding the solution? No, David. David. David wasn't involved with the water with the two water teams. There was a desalinization team and an abundance team. Um, he wasn't on the design of the prize team. He actually has a device. He and his company called SkySource that 
harvests humidity from the air and creates clean potable drinking water in in what in what x prize proposal was that part of was that the one that came out of the one you did or was that another one no that came from um it started with will sarney's team for the for the water abundance prize which was one of the one of the teams that was with us on this whole adventure okay but but now three years later they launched that prize and david david hertz just happened to be one of the teams to compete for it and and he won his team won yeah that was that was recent not only is david a great guy but he's a brilliant architect and now and but he's also kind of a renaissance man because he's also in the years that i've known him he started his own material company called syndesis which takes electronics waste and converts it into a type of like concrete terrazzo remember that yeah yeah he yeah that was years ago i think he that sold that too. yeah yeah he sold that and moved on to other things and then uh, um he built a house for uh he built a house for a guy in venice who's um who makes uh he makes these weird panels for refrigerated industrial plants so he made the house out of these cool insulated refrigerated panels so it's a super it's a super insulated building he's just a brilliant guy he took he took a, a discarded 747 airplane and made it into a house yeah i interviewed him years ago for my old architectural what the what was it for my other business approachable architect podcast i don't think you can find it but i interviewed him about the wing house um fascinating episode and really interesting guy we should actually, I'll reach out to him about, it'd be great to have him on talking about the, the X prize, um, the, the water thing. That would be great actually. Right. And, and so it's, it just shows what a small world it is. You know, like I said, I knew, I knew some of the other people that were the visioneers of the other teams when I walked in on day one and like, Oh, what are you doing here? But, but then to have other friends then compete for these as these prizes have been slowly rolling out, you know, because the X prize folks are so deliberate with what they do, they, they, they warn me, listen, it, you got to be patient. It's, we don't just, we don't just throw these things out there. Like we, we do a lot of planning ahead of time. So what has happened to the proposal that went out, um, a couple of years ago? Uh, has anything happened to that? Have they, have they formally launched it? What's going on with that? So, um, for the construction side, my team and the affordable housing team, um, we kind of uh, coordinated our efforts and figured out this very rough roadmap and we presented it at the summit um, without getting too technical. Uh, but from that, it, w- we ended up just kind of shooting ourselves in the foot because the XPRIZE folks said, oh my God, this is amazing. I think we need to develop a, a, a whole construction impact roadmap. Right. So then they spent two years developing this roadmap, which is now finally done. Okay. And and mapped out these these eighteen potential X prizes. So I, I think I ended up shooting myself in the foot by by showing them what fertile ground it is. Yeah, now and, they now they know the possibilities. But but right. what happened to the the one that you competed in, the one that they selected to launch, what happened with that one? So would that was uh, that the cancer one? The cancer one, as far as I know, has not yet launched. Okay. I don't know I don't know why. The ALS one the ALS one had a bit of a snafu. The, the the visionary team leader for that team, and I didn't mention this until now, uh, he's the CEO of of Caterpillar, which is the you know the the tractor people. Yeah, yeah. Not only was Caterpillar the sponsor, but the CEO himself was the bold visionary because he himself has ALS. Interesting. So part of the bittersweet of it is this super nice sweetheart of a guy is suffering with ALS which is pretty much a, a sadly a death sentence for as when you get diagnosed and um, and so his prize was always designed to go on after he died in fact he would talk he talked about that very openly and everybody's crying about it so I don't know what's happening with the ALS prize I don't I don't I frankly I don't even know what's happened to him since um, and I I don't want to be you know kind of morbid and right and say, what's, oh, how's he doing? You know, so I, I don't know. And then the Avatar Prize was supposed to launch right away and still hasn't. And I, and again, I don't know why. Okay. And when I, when I ask questions, I don't, I don't really, nobody seems to know. Yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, I don't really uh, care because I'm fixated on my prize. And so I've been fighting to keep ProStruction relevant, keep it, you know, keep it on top of mind for the X Prize staff. And so having this roadmap, this impact roadmap done. And ProStruction's part of it is is already great. And now that it's finally done, now I, you know, for the next year, I'm going to be pushing them to, okay, 
let's let's re rally again and get this going and, and launch it. And if not, I'm gonna I'm gonna I want to pull a team together and try to try to make something happen on my own. Well, it, it, it is interesting because you mentioned you shot yourself in the foot um, because you showed them the fertile ground and now there's this, this um, you know, 18 potential prizes. Uh, maybe this would have happened at some point. Their eyes, the X prize personnel, the eyes would have been open to them about the construction possibilities at some point down the road. But obviously you were um, instrumental in in really sowing those seeds uh for sure right well and not i mean no there was a lot of there was a lot of us the affordable housing team was great there's five folks there my team was amazing there's five folks there they had other experts come in um you know uh steve glenn from living homes he's one of the advisors he came in and talked to them all about prefab and the issues with prefab and the challenges he's having because we thought about maybe we need to find a prefabrication prize okay. some way to kind of like stamp these out like um like jello molds or something right so we, we you know there's so much more that we explored that i didn't even touch on here in this podcast for the sake of time because remember it's nine months of work so but it it so okay so it sounds like when you started the x prize uh a few years ago that that maybe this is when building construction and building in general and how we build maybe that is the the beginning of of now what is become is going to become a more of a play more of a role in the x prize stuff moving forward yes and i think i think what's clear is and i'm i'm all for this every time i post something on twitter or linkedin about 3d printing i get yelled at by by my architect buddies because they're like oh 3d printing is a dead end blah 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 but to me here's what we need and I'm and I, I'm we're going to post this as an, as an image in the podcast because I I think it's so important. We need to find a way to build buildings without relying on human labor because we we have a shortage of construction laborers. We need to find a way to speed construction because we need to build essentially the equivalent of New York City every five weeks for the next thirty three years worldwide. We need to find a way to scale assembly. So let's leverage the assembly line things that we've learned in the last hundred years. Let's leverage robots. Let's leverage anything we can to scale the assembly because we need to build affordable housing for everyone, not just rich people. We need to find a way to lower costs because I think we've, we've squeezed out every efficiency we can out of normal framing and normal building and we're, we're, there's no more to be had. And then, of course, all the environmental impacts. We need to find a way to eliminate construction waste, to sequester carbon, to avoid all known carcinogens from going into the building in the first place, and to build and increase biodiversity. We need to do all eight of these things, and we need to do them now. And prostruction is, in my mind, one way that could do this. But there are lots of other ways to do it. And so I'm all for things that tackle these eight market failures. That's interesting. The the labor issue, I hadn't really maybe thought too much about that before, but I guess, again, with building construction, the building industry being behind the times a little bit, right? Automobiles are built by robots. Uh, a lot of things are manufactured by robots on an assembly line. Right. Buildings aren't. Like, buildings are still a very manually labor intensive obviously prefab uh, but even at prefab they're still built uh, they're built off site but they're still built by hand yeah they 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 go down an assembly line but still with human workers assembling them yeah well for my own selfish reasons i would love to see robots because i went through three drywall guys in my vegas house and it was just <laughs> it was awful and just relying on just people who don't show up and do crappy work. So yeah, if we can have robots do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. This was, this was a um, uh, really cool episode. Quite uh, a tale to tell, isn't it? It's quite a tale to tell. What a life, what a once in a lifetime um, opportunity. And, um, and it's just so right up your alley. I hope more, uh, I shouldn't say hope. I know more will happen with it. Neither of us probably know how, in what shape or form, but it's, it's. I don't think we've heard the end of this story. No, 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 not at all. And and mind you, since then, I've recorded a TED Talk on, on this subject. Um, I've been consulting with companies all over about this. We've been trying to find a way to do this. We, I've been approached by people that want to to grow something, 
and you know so lots of lots of good stuff has happened from it but in the meantime i'm still you know my day to day is still as a green architect trying to do zero carbon net zero energy buildings so i'm i'm also doing that and this is kind of still my side hobby yeah it's just another plate up in the air that you're tossing around <laughs> right spinning yeah <laughs> All right. I think that's going to uh, wrap it up uh, hour and 20 minutes. Uh, hopefully you've made it to the end because it's a pretty fascinating uh, episode. And, and uh, if you haven't figured out by now, Eric is the smart one uh, of the two of us. <laughs> I thought I was the handsome one. <laughs> that too, but you're only like five nine. So, oh, yeah. I mean, not that that's bad, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, my name is David Doucette on behalf of Eric Corey Freed. This has been the ARE Podcast. We will see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the ARE Podcast. Be sure to visit architectexamprep.com and check out our other podcast episodes, video tips, and the ARE blog. Remember to plan, practice, and pass. 